All right, question one shows the axis used to um, plot distance time graph. All right, we have to draw one with a constant speed label A and decreasing speed labeling it B. B. Yeah, here you go. So if this a straight line going upwards is A, and that would be increasing speed, and a straight line, make sure I'm not drawing it with the ruler so it doesn't look straight, but it has to be a straight line going downwards. And this would be B. Um, shows the axis plus B time graph. Moving with the constant acceleration, label this S, increasing acceleration. So if you draw from here to here a straight line only and label it S, that's constant. And then if you move it, so increasing would be like this. It goes, 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 and increases. That would be T. All right. And why is the acceleration increasing if it goes up like that? Um, it's increasing because um, a constant acceleration means you're accelerating at a constant rate. So zero point seven second meter, zero point seventeen meter per second squared. You're going at that constant rate always. But here is not constant because this point from this point has a different gradient as compared to this point and this point. So the acceleration is changing and it's increasing because it's sloping upwards. Same with this sloping upwards. I mean, it's straight and going upwards. So it's a constant acceleration, which is positive. I mean, constant speed, which is positive and the straight line going downwards is a constant speed that's decreasing. All right, next question. A plane is at rest on an airport runway. The brakes of the plane are released and the engine of the plane provides a constant accelerating force. Use the following data, all right? Ignore any resistive forces, so you can equalize all the forces if you like. So constant forward force. So force is equal to 56, one, two, three. Um, mass is equal to 16, 1, 2, 3, is it 3, yep, and your time is equal to 16 seconds. Use the following data to calculate the takeoff speed of the plane. Alright, and this question says the plane was first at rest, so it's, on the, it's at rest and they want the takeoff speed, so this was the runway. And this is the plane at rest, so it must have zero meter per second. And then the plane goes, 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 and then takes off into the sky. So at this point, it should have the takeoff speed, which is the x meter per second. So how do we calculate that? Well, we well first let's just we have a force, we have a mass, and a, a time. Let's just get an acceleration f equals m a a is equal to force 56 1 2 3 5 16 1 2 3 16 1 2 3 is 3 zeros 3 zeros therefore acceleration is equal to 3.5 meter per second squared all right now we have I just found acceleration just so we can have because we already have force and mass we already have a uh, we have time but then we know we can get acceleration so I'm just getting all the things I can get well we have now we have these three and acceleration and we just said that it was at zero meter per second in the beginning and final it's some um, x meter per second we have a formula the momentum formula f is equal to m into v minus u over time taken so what is how do we do this now so we have to calculate any of these forces we have to calculate the takeoff speed so force is equal to the mass 16 1 2 3 into v which is x we don't know we want the final one minus zero because the initial final minus initial final is this initial is zero upon the time taken which is 16 um 
16 seconds and uh, and the force here is 56 one two three three zeros yep rearrange the equation and you will get x as that x is equal to 56 and that's meter per second because we found and we said x is the final speed so the speed is 56 meter per second so yep if well in this case i found acceleration just to be sure but we could have just got these three plugged it in the formula with our very basic knowledge of this and then just this part on the right would be our working for four marks but then you don't need to do it in this way i mean if you couldn't come up with this you could just use the acceleration formula acceleration is equal to v minus u upon time this is just an extra method if you didn't want to use this one so acceleration is 3.5 equal to well the final the final velocity is x minus the initial the initial velocity we know the speed the initial speed of the plane is zero meter per second it's then accelerated to x meter per second uh, it's x minus the initial which is zero upon the time taken 16 and then 3.5 times 16 x so this x is equal to 56 meter per second and always put in the units you get one mark one mark one mark three marks and one more mark for the um unit 50 meter per second all right hope you understood this let's go explain why momentum is a vector quantity it's a vector quantity because momentum for this momentum is equal to the force times the distance which usually force we put newton and distance we put newton meter so the reason momentum is a vector quantity not a scalar quantity is because so why is momentum a vector quantity because it has both direction and mag magnitude newton the force is the magnitude because magnitude is literally the size of a force and direction is direction next question the crumple zone at the front of the car designed to collapse during a collision in a laboratory test a car mass of this all right driven to a concrete wall okay a video recording of the test shows the car is brought to rest in this much time when it collides with the wall the speed of the car before the collision is this much the change of momentum of the car so what is the change of momentum so the change of momentum is well if you check here oh hold on let me just quickly the change of momentum is mass into delta v which is mass into v minus u all right so just the mass is 1200 so this 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 the speed of the car before the collision is this 7.5 meters per second so that means the speed of the car of before before the collision is 7.5 meter per second and then if it's bought to so the car was here let's say this is the line and this is the car here this is the car when it hits the wall so the speed of the car before the collision is 7.5 meter per second and after the collision it's zero so that's basically 1200 into zero minus 7.5 before the collision is this much after it it was this so in this case the final speed is this the initial speed was this and if we multiply this out we're gonna get negative 9000 negative 9000 and the units would be kg meter per second meter per second is speed kg is obviously mass negative 9000 kg 
meter per second. Yep, the average force acting on the car. Well, this is easy. The force, average force acting on the car is a change of momentum, which is um, 9,000. Nine thousand plus m into delta v m into v minus u by the time taken, which is zero point three six seconds. Well, the actual formula uses m into v minus u upon t. There's a, f a formula relating to the force with change of momentum by time, and if we do 9,000 divided by 3.6 we're gonna get 2,500 and let me just put it for the marks 2,500 that's gonna be Newton yep Newton oh hold on there's an extra zero divide by 0 0.36 all right and well, how come I didn't put a negative symbol the force a force is well, the the size of the force is two thousand five hundred. You don't really have to put a negative positive symbol when when you have the actual force. It's just the magnitude of the force is this much. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. As for momentum, it specifies the actual what happened. If that means like it specifies how much like energy, how much mass and how fast it should be traveling, how much of that is needed to slow the car down. And in this case, it should be negative. If it was positive 9,000, it'll be double of that. So instant death. So it's negative 9,000. This is how much speed for, the, for an object is needed to slow this car down. But as for the force, that really doesn't matter. Let's check. A different car has a mass of 1,500 kg. It collides with the same wall and all of the energy transferred during the collision is absorbed by the crumpled wall. The energy absorbed by the crumpled wall is this. Show that the speed of the car before the collision is this. Alright, so all of the energy was absorbed. There's nothing lost. So we can equalize, we can equalize, you know, the, the crash with the speed. The energy of the crumpled wall is 4.3. 4.3 times 10 to the power 5 and then show the speed of the car before the collision is this much so this is the final answer so we have mass so mass is 1000 times they want the speed of the car before the collision is this much so what relates mass and speed and in a force equation I mean I mean in an energy equation well we have the formula E is equal to half mv squared so we can do half times v squared and since they said all the energy of the car was transferred to all of the energy of the crumple zone when it crashed they said the energy absorbed by the crumple zone was the same energy that the car smashed with into the wall. So that means the two energies can be equalized. So the crumple zone energy absorbed this much is equal to the kinetic energy of the car, half mv squared. So v squared or the actual final v is equal to 24 meter per second and that's just two marks so just what would happen to the car if it's traveling faster than 24 meter per second when it hits the wall well the it from the uh, diagram below it just showed that the engine you know just got just like the front part of the car got destroyed if it was supposed to go faster it would result in more damage or you can put example um the more parts of the car will be deformed of than some bullshit like that well these questions do seem a bit hard to think but to actually do them is not exactly that hard well i hope
Well, hope this clears the doubts in this paper. Let's continue. And if you're still a bit confused in this question, this is the car, it moves and boom, crashes the wall. So all and the, all of the energy of this car that's moving, 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 crashes and all of the energy of, of the crash is absorbed by the wall, which is this, and the car is moving, kinetic energy, half mv squared. All right, let's continue. A stationary object is acted upon a number of forces. State the conditions which must be true if the object does not accelerate, does not rotate. There must be no re no resultant force. Resultant force means like um if I punch like if I push if both of us push on each other and if I push harder and you move back but you push equally as hard and we just stay still there's no force acting in the left nor the right direction there's no result so there must be a result in force same thing if it were to rotate if I push down but you push down equally I mean but if you pushed up equally and this thing does not rotate there's no result, it stays in the same position. So again, you can repeat the same answer. There must be no result in force. This shows a boat that has been lifted out of a river. The boat is suspended by two ropes, it is stationary. The weight of the boat acting at the center of mass is this. All right, weight going downwards is this. The tension in the ropes are T1, T2. Determine the moments of the weight of the boat upon about point P moment moment with that rho symbol for Greek is equal to force times the perpendicular distance which is the force going downwards twenty four times twenty four thousand because force is a newton times the distance zero point four and look here 90 degrees perpendicular which will be equal to if i type that in properly in my calculator i am going to get 9600 newton meter 9600 newton meter all right um the tension t1 so what is the tension t1 if you see this boat, it's in a stationary position. So if I cut out T1, we know that the boat is going to rotate this way. But if it rotates this way, which, what is it gonna ro rotate about? It's not gonna rotate about the center, it's gonna rotate about point P. Because that's where the rope is. The rope is holding the boat here and the boat will turn at point P. You try it, put a hole here and here, make a copy of this, put a hole here and here, hold it up with your hands and cut T1. It's gonna rotate and when it rotates, it's gonna rotate about this point. So when this thing is cut, the thing's gonna rotate and once it rotates, the boat's gonna more or less look like this in this position. So let's just say um, I'm going to put like this part here from here to here is T2 so um, if we see clearly here when I'm pushing the marker I'm pushing it with a force so I'm, I have to push it with the force for a distance until it reaches this neutral state so T1 is a force acting upward that when moved along a distance a total distance of 1.6 is going to equal 9600 newton meter because to move the boat when it's like this about point p which is this point here about point p you need 9600 newton meter 
That's why the previous question asks us to calculate the moment, how much force is required to turn it from this point. You may ask what about T2? What is T2 doing if it's neutral? If it's neutral like this, uh, let me get back this thing here. If it's neutral, and from here to here is T2. What about T2? Isn't T1 times the distance 1.6 actually equal to the to the moment about point P as well as T2? Nope, it's not equal to T2. T2 is just like a placeholder. And the reason we can take it as a placeholder is because its total effect is neutral because the boat is stationary. That's the key point, stationary. So its effect with T1 is neutral. That's why we can just take T2 as a placeholder. So T1 times 1.6 is that. Therefore, T1 is equal to um, 6,000 newtons. Alright, great. The tension T2. We know that T1, 6,000 plus T2 should be equal to 24,000 newtons as um as it's stationary so these these two forces should be equal to that and t2 will be equal to 18 1 2 3 another way to do this if you don't like it is if we snap t2 away it's going to rotate about this point so we need to find the moment how much force is required to turn at this point that's 1.2 times the weight of the boat, 24, 1, 2, 3, which is equal to... And one more thing I want to state is that if we turned the boat P, like if T1 was, was, if T1 was a force, but let's say we know it's 9,600 newton newtons to move from this point P. If we moved it for one meter, it's going to be obviously T1 times 1, which is still 9,600. But because we move it more than 1 meter, we get different T1 values. Sorry, 6,000 newtons. So you can see when we keep increasing the distance, we actually use le less newtons. And that should be correct. Whatever the case is, the main point is, it is 9,600 newtons to move it from this point but because we're moving it a distance our actual force to move the boat about this point for the given distance isn't actually 9,600 if it was for exactly one meter it would be 9,600 exactly shows a Galilean thermometer the thermometer is used to measure the approximate temperature of the surrounding air Oh yeah, and if I do sound tired, please don't blame me guys. I really am. The glass cylinder contains water. Alright, you probably read the question. Explain in terms of density why the bulb A is at the bottom of the cylinder and the other bulbs are floating. So, only two marks. Yeah, nice, I like it. So, in terms of density, so all have different densities. And they said that the density of the water changes with temperature. So bulb A has a higher density because it's more heavy that's why it sinks density than the water and other bulbs that yeah um, that that is why it sinks. Sorry, that is why it sinks. So um, we explained in terms of density why A is at the bottom of the cylinder, and the other bulbs are floating. So we have to explain in terms of density. We answered for part A. Why why are the other bulbs floating in terms of density? If A has a higher density than water and it falls, that means the others have to have lower density. Other bulbs bulbs float come as they have a lower 
density then so water you could probably fit all of that in I can strike that out the temperature of the surrounding air increases 23 degrees Celsius so just one reason why there is a delay before the temperature of the water increases to 23 degrees Celsius glass cylinder and a glass cylinder now glass cylinder you can't just write glass cylinder you have to mention something about the glass cylinder the glass cylinder is a poor conductor of heat um, ducto conductor of heat uh, so who cares if it's a poor conductor of heat you might say um, if this is a poor conductor of heat that means it doesn't absorb that heat easily and doesn't transfer it easily to the water that means it's it's hard for it to absorb the heat and then since it's hard for it to absorb the heat some of the energy disappears and then <laughs> or since it does it'll take longer to actually transfer into this and then that's why it takes time or you could have mentioned like um water has a high specific heat capacity so that means to increase the, the uh, to increase the actual temperature of the water you need a greater energy and since high heat capacity just means it holds onto that temperature longer that's why you can just say water has a high specific heat capacity because the heat capacity of a material is how quickly it heats up and cools down yeah how much energy if you put in energy it is just how quickly how slowly it heats up and as for water it has a high specific heat capacity that means it takes much energy to heat it up and that means it keeps the cooler temperature longer and then after some time increases to 23 degrees celsius and that's why water is weird <laughs> but your safest bet to is just to put this explain why after this delay bulb B sinks assume the bulbs do not expand so after this delay the temperature of the water well the temperature of the water is now at 23 degrees Celsius so what, what's happening well the I'm gonna put is you guys put in properly the water molecules cules um they expand they expand and after these molecules expand comma the water becomes less dense i think you guys are seeing where i'm going So explain why after this delay bulb B sinks. Assume the assume the bulbs don't expand. So after this delay, the water is at 23 degrees Celsius. That means the water molecules expand, and since the volume increases, density is equal to mass by volume. If this in, they're inversely proportional, given if this stays constant. So so if this increases, this decreases. So the density of water water molecules expand comma water becomes less dense correct and um, now if it's less dense and this is a 23 degrees Celsius this label is 22 well uh, bell B will decrease because its temperature is less than the surrounding temperature of water and it will fall down not only because of the temperature but what you call it it's because bell B has like now has a greater density because it now it's at 22 degrees celsius that means its molecules are closer than the water which is at a higher temperature and a higher volume so its water molecules are more spread out mean, means its volume is higher and its density decreases so what happens now the water molecules expand water becomes less dense and bulb b sinks as it has 
a greater uh, sorry for my writing greater density density than water you put in water in your exam okay so if you understand the question like you can see it can easily trick you to mention temperature but it's all to do with the densities because that's how it works because this question does give you a hint to answer the following questions now we know that the main reason bulb a sank because it was mainly due to density and since its temperature was um its temperature was lower than the water's temperature 2021 we know why bulb a sank in terms of density so we, we can apply that same rule here and explain this thing in terms of density because if we just simply state that because of the temperature it's it's not really a valid reason and it's not that strong that's why i explain in terms of density bulbs a b and c are now at the bottom of the temperature bulbs d and e are floating state the possible temperature range range so what what is floating d and e d and e are floating so state the possible temperature range of the water in the cylinder a possible temperature range so that's 24 24 degrees celsius until 26 degrees celsius so that's the range the temperature range is in between these two in between 24 degrees celsius and in till 26 degrees celsius since this is 24 and our range is in between in between 24 and 26 not 20 is not 26 and it's not 24 it's in between those so that means 24.1 until 25.9 we know this will start singing but at 25.9 this thing won't sing sink and that's the temperature range the temperature range means you yeah, know between which temperatures all right and also you know you need to know what a range <laughs> what a range is guys <laughs> let's go state two ways in which evaporation is different from boiling so evaporation is different it takes place at any temperature and takes place at the surface not surface of the liquid just surface surface because we don't know what they're talking about a liquid solid water we don't know but we know that evaporation takes place at any temperature and at the surface give one example of a change of state which does not involve boiling or evaporation change of state so that could be freezing it's not boiling it doesn't evaporate it's freeze it condenses it cools you can say freezing or melting or sublimation condensation anything so the substance is initially liquid states what taking place at the positions so at a the liquid is cooling cooling yep and what is it doing at b well obviously the liquid is freezing or you could say changing into solid and what is at c happening at c well now if it's a liquid that's cooling cooling and it's cool and now for it's staying at a certain temperature and now the liquid is freezing uh, or turning into solid solid now what's happening here the solid is no more liquid because you have liquid and solid here but now as soon as you leave this point it's only solid 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 the solid is cooling so just why the graph is deeper at point c than at point a that's because this um specific heat capacity you write this in words okay guys of liquid is greater than the specific 
the capacity of solids of a liquid of a solid you write this in words you can use the top and the bottom so why did I say specific heat capacity if you check why well, it's deeper a metal if you heat it up it cools down really fast that means it doesn't have a strong heat capacity but if you boil up water it heats up and then for it to reduce from 100 degrees celsius to something lower it really takes quite some time so it holds the heat more that means its specific heat capacity of water or, or of a liquid is greater than specific heat capacity of a solid shows an apparatus used to determine some effect of the transformer of and transfer of energy by radiation nice setup the glass bulb painted matte black all right all right all right all right i'll continue all right glows red when the switch is on all right state two types of radiation that is heat that is emitted by the heater nice it glows red first thing before you put in even infrared we put in visible um light Radi visible light gets radiated away because it glows red and i really am tired sorry guys visible light gets radiated because of the red glow and then infrared because it heats infrared how many marks um before they sorry before the heater is switched on the liquid leaves levels in the glass tube are the same say and explain any changes in the liquid levels that take place when the heater is switched on so what happens the matte matte blacks are better at absorbing so the matte black bulb absorbs heat more quickly all right comma the air now that it absorbs all the heat more quickly than this shitty bulb here that means it's hotter now that means if it's hotter the air molecules um the air molecules you know they expand expand and when they expand the when they expand we know what's going to happen to the water level so we did say that the matte black bulb absorbs heat more quickly come the air molecules expand so the water level and the water level on the left mm. decreases as no so why does it decrease it decreases as the temp temperature i'm putting temp you put in temperature as the temperature of air increases and the okay so if the temperature increases here First, this thing was initially pushing it with with a certain pressure. There exists a certain pressure on this. When it gains more energy from heat, it push, pushes out a higher pressure. That's why this thing goes down. So it decrease um on the left decreases, comma as the temperature of the air increases and pressure. Increases on the left. All right, so we know, and I think this should be enough. Should we have temperature? We have pressure one two. We stated that it rises more here and is decreased here three, and we stated that the matte bulb, matte black, absorbs the heat four. All right, we should be good.
plus as an extra bonus we mentioned the air molecule expanding thing all right next question shows an object and it's formed by a converging lens one of one ray from the tip of object to the tip of the image is shown this is drawn in full size please play oh sorry <laughs> place a tick in all boxes that are cor that correctly describe the image so in every single box even if it's two marks it doesn't mean it's two let's just think what's going to happen it's inverted it's inverted and we also know that the image is real and what else it's going through a lens the lens every single lens is not pure even if it is pu pure the light rays still pass through it and you know it passes through from different mediums there is a possibility that the actual image is diminished in a tiny way because always with lenses the image does seem to be diminished a bit and we can also know it's diminished just a bit because um the image is flipped it's inverted that means it's diminished a bit like diminished means in terms of clarity but it should be reduced a bit because this distance here and here is different from that distance from here to here and as well as what you call it it's inverted and uh, and also it's real because um, um let me tell you something why it's real if once i tell you it's real complete what you learn so just completely forget what you learn about real and virtual use the definition of the book when answering what is the difference between real and virtual images but the main reason this is real is because the rays form an image but the ray is not reflected the ray passes through and if you make a ray go here it's going to refract now the reason this is a real image is because the image, I mean, the reason because it's real is because the image formed is formed with the existing rays itself. If it's a mirror, it would reflect back. If, let's say, another ray came, it would reflect back. And then, even these rays reflect back. But then if you extend it, extend the, let's say, a type of virtual ray, you find that on a mirror, it, an image still forms, even if the rays are reflected that that make what makes it virtual it's a predicted ray that goes back and forms an x so it's not exactly the actual ray itself because that actual ray is reflected it's just the image it creates because it was reflected back yep now let me just rub this out get back All right now i've rubbed it out and also you can just say um, on images with mirrors what you call it is virtual because it's more like imaginary rays that are drawn backwards from the reflective ones all right let's go and but this one is real it's formed with the actual ray draw a ray passing through the principal focus on the lens from the tip of the object all right tip of the object to the tip of the image label the principal focus so it has to pass through the principal focus. Principal focus is always the center of the lens. La and then label the principal focus. The principal focus is always the length from the center to the image. And I'm going to do all the questions and explain it. So I did it and behind the scenes. Let me explain it because it's hard to do if I do it at the same time. If I draw at the same time. So use the ray you've drawn in B to determine the focal length of the lens. The focal length is always the length from the center to the image. So it's just basically this length until the this part here, the image is formed here, and this ray and this ray cross here. So it's just from the center to here. And this thing can vary for many people. That's why you can put 5.2 or 5.3 or something. And just for um, for safe sake, I'm labeling, labeling Oh, uh, label the principal focus. Sorry, the principal focus F. The sorry, the principal focus is F. Yeah, the principal focus is F. So from here all the way to here. Ignore this. Sorry. Yeah. So that's five point two centimeters because they say to determine the focal length is five point two centimeters. From here, the principal focus labeled F until there, and um. 
draw this part it says draw ray passing the to the principal focus of the lens from the tip of the object of the image and label the principal focus um f so I already labeled it f and then we already calculated the distance but <laughs> you should do b before c i just saw that first so um er, from the tip of the object yep and then they said um to the tip of the image which is done and then they said something similar for the other one draw another ray not passing through the principal focus not passing through the center in other words um that passes from the tip of the object to the tip of the image so the tip of the image is here so what is the tip of the of the object now this object is 3.2.3 centimeters it needs to pass from the tip but it shouldn't cross the principal focus so basically it's just that same line but with 2.3 centimeters downwards because that's the object so it's still at the tip it goes to the lens after it hits the lens it converges and hits the image done from the tip of the object tip of the image all right let's go next question i think i have to speed it up now time's almost done for the exam transformer consists of two coils of wire suggest the material from which the two coils are made state the reasons why suggest the material from the core so the coil the coil is made up of copper why because copper is a good conductor of electricity what about the core the core is made up of soft iron not just iron soft iron because it's easy to magnetize and demagnetize all right next um state the difference between x and y x is x is gonna have to do something to this so it can go along that and oh hold on x transfer that to that because the current flowing through here is flowing through these cables which is that and then y reduce this to that so obviously x is a step up because this was stepped up to that and why is a step down transformer transformer explain why a very high voltage is used to for transmission over long distance all right why because one it reduces power losses all right guys second is because it reduces loss of um loss of energy through heat but then now i think about it those two do seem like the same point just put as extra so the main point you should put in for why it's a very high voltage is used is because it reduces power losses from the emission of heat yep that sounds more like strong and bolder and then a high voltage reduces the current high voltage re um, gives us low current and the reason we don't want a high current is because obviously that makes us lose energy through heat so the first point was a high voltage gives us low current second point is it reduces power losses through the you know through the emission of heat and the third is because um because thin cables are used because thin cables are used to transport um electricity from yeah because thin thin cables are used to transport electricity over long distances you can't use thick heavy cables thick heavy cables um you can't use them because they would sag and then they would just break we need to use thin long ones because only for the reason so they don't sag and break and we need a high voltage because if we have a high voltage it reduces the current and because it reduces the current it we don't need to use heavy cables and that snap we can we, the reason we need a high voltage is because we actually use thin cables to transport the electricity all right that's your three suggests why why the voltage for use by a home consumer is 240 volts and much much higher because 240 volts is safe for usage by a consumer as anything higher is you know is not safe is is dangerous the reason you can't just say because um 
anything above 240 volts is dangerous by itself is because you're explaining um, why the voltage is 240 is 240 volts because it's safe and not is not much higher because it would be dangerous to come to the consumers all right next question shows a graph of current against potential difference for filament lamp state what happens to the resistance of filament lamp as the potential different changes from zero to one volt oh well it's constant because a straight uh, upward sloping straight line remember as we said in the beginning shows um shows constant acceleration or constant speed in this in this case um it's the resistance is constant constant resistance all right now from 1 to 1 to 8 so from this point to 8 well the resistance increases increases All right at normal brightness the potential difference across the lamp is this much 8 volts calculate for normal brightness or right, normal brightness the resistance of the lamp so we have voltage and we need to calculate power so oh no hold on what for oh, the resistance sorry resistance is equal to V by I which is equal to voltage 8 volts by mm, 8 voltage if I check 8 it crosses at this point and that is um, 0 0.72 I think yeah 0 0.72 which is equal to 11 oh my god please help me 11 ohms yeah draw draw more better than me sorry and three marks three marks is not because of only because of the working it's also because of this ohm symbol yeah the power of the lamp and remember these are all for normal brightness normal brightness the resistance normal brightness the power power is equal to v squared by r which is equal to 8 squared by 11 which is equal to 5.8 watts 5.8 watts 5.8 watts why v squared by r because power has three formulas iv v squared by r and um, i squared r and in this case they just gave us the um, voltage and it's only two marks for me i don't want to waste time that's why I used power equal V squared by R. It doesn't matter. Anything you use, it'll give you the same answer. All right. Five of the these lamps operating at normal brightness. So the normal brightness of the lamps are connected in parallel. All right. The electromotive force of the power supply. The electromotive force is eight. The eight voltage. Eight. Um. You know. The electromotive force is just mainly the potential difference, which is the voltage, which is 8 volts. Um, I should have actually put on 8 volts. Yep. Not just 8 by itself, but all right. Um, the current from the power supply. Um, if you check the question before, just by rewinding, you'll see it's 8 volts. The current from the power supply. All right. Now what is the current and why is there only one mark if it seems a bit complicated well you can calculate the current you can say <laughs> yeah but let me tell you the easy method screw any other hard method so we know in a parallel um, circuit we know that the voltage stays constant but then we know the current varies and to find what the actual total current is, I total is equal to I1 plus I2 dot 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 for so how many I's they are. So that's for the parallel circuit. As for a series, we know the current stays constant, but the voltage varies. 
So the formula for that one would be VT is equal to V1 plus V2 dot 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 dot. This is there in the syllabus and it's in your book. So what is the I total? Well, I total, and check the other question at normal brightness, um, the bulb's current is 0 0.72 and five times of that because of that, um, because we have five lamps, which is 0 0.72 at, um, which is 3.6 amps. You can say five times this or zero point seven two add to itself five times three point six amps. Yep, that's the easy method. Yeah, but then you, you really need to know about what I said for the parallel that the current varies but the voltage doesn't and for series the voltage varies but not the current. You just need to know that. To test that, test it like test literally test it. Tell test the voltage in every one of these is going to be the same but test it if it was in a series is going to be different that's how they came up with these rules all right describe in terms of particles and terminals of a battery the movement of charge in an electric in an electric circuit so it's electrons move in electrons move in a circuit right in a circuit from the negative terminal right negative terminal to the positive terminal and you know what I'm gonna say there right the positive terminal yep and why didn't we say what about positive ions their charges as well they could have moved dude when you connect up a battery just a normal battery you what you call it Electrons move. There is no current in a battery. If it was a power supply, that was like power from your mains or something, then the electrons move from the um, negative to the positive. But then there's also conventional current. It's called conventional current for a reason because it's meant for the house. It comes from the actual power supply. But in a normal battery, no. Current usually doesn't flow is first the electrons current isn't really in a battery all right let's go is mainly electrons um shows a lightning flash between a cloud and the ground beneath the charge built up on the cloud before the lightning flash is 0 0.60 0 coulombs this charge is completely transferred to the ground by the lightning flash in this much second calculate the current below all right q is equal to i t 5 times 10 to the power negative 5 i times is equal to 0 0.6 that means i is equal to um, 12 1 2 3 amps 12 1 2 3 amps that's straightforward the potential difference between the cloud and the ground during the lightning flash is this calculate the energy transferred by the lightning flash E is equal to all right energy transferred by the lightning flash we know that we had Q is equal to I T and we know that we have I and we have T now we have I we have T and they gave us voltage voltage and they want us to calculate the energy so what energy transfers the energy transfer from here to here so what formula of energy contains volt um, voltage current and time power is equal to energy is equal to ivt which is power times time iv is equal to power so energy is equal to one two one two three uh, times voltage which is 2.5 times 10 to the power 8 times the time which is 5 times 10 to the power negative 5 if you do all of this in your calculator you will get 1.5 and you f when you have to you have to round off to two significant figures and write in standard form because obviously they ask the question like this and then if you get a huge number you obviously it's in two significant figures two significant figures and you multiply it and you have to put times 10 to the power 8 similarly you could have in this case here you have a varied amount of significant figures here 
but you have like two here no you have one two but then you have many here so i think you don't really you can if you want but then just leave it like this you already usually write the answer according to the significant figures specified in the question or like not specified but is used in the question so just what happens to the energy calculated in BII so this energy so now this question they're asking us um, what happens to the energy when it's transferred from here to here well there's no humors or anything so we can't mention stuff with fatalities and stuff but we can say that the energy is converted converted to light and sound all right because you know when lightning flashes strike you always see the light then you hear the sound so the energy not all of it but it is converted to light and sound and obviously what else are we gonna put in you can't put in stuff with death you can put in heat and replace one of these two and put in heat but then um <laughs> what are you gonna do really and you, the reason i put light and sound is you can't only have light and no sound you either have light sound light heat or sound heat and heat sound whatever you need to you really need to you can't have one only all right let's go next question our last final question blah 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 all right let's get into this detector here first is 150 counts paper is added yep then falls to 60 magnetic field perpendicular all right now it's at 20 they just don't worry about the perpendicular Fleming's left hand right hand rule in this question i'll tell you why their count rates have not been corrected all right and is measures 20 counts per second the background radiation so don't worry about the direction and stuff it just knows perpendicular that's all just know that there was an actual magnetic field that was set up you don't have to worry about the Fleming's left hand rule because it doesn't say anything about calculating the magnetic field or the force or the current nothing so leave it and that yeah just just you know forget about it so the current rates have not been corrected for background so if they're not being corrected for the background we know that the final recording was 20 counts per second and we also know that the background is 20 counts per second so that means alpha was produced beta was produced not gamma because the what you call it the count rates were um the final count rate is equal to the background if it were adjusted then is gonna the final rate will be counted as zero all right um state the evidence that each type of radiation is present in or absent from all right we already know uh, um this thing is absent absent comma as radiation um it's you know it's not there as radiation um with all right with paper and magnetic field you write magnetic field guys i'm writing mg field is equal to write equal properly is equal to background radiation background radiation sorry i'm being lazy it's present because it is absorbed by the paper absorbed by the paper absorbed absorbed by the paper and this one is present as it is deflected by the magnetic <laughs> field sorry i'm just lazy but you write it properly so again why can't gamma be deflected by the magnetic field and why is it 20 the reason the gamma is not pres present is because it's equal to the background radiation but if you want to find more reasons as to why gamma is not present is because in a magnetic field beta and alpha get deflected because of their charges gamma has no charge at all but so it doesn't get deflected by a narrow beam of radiation and they also said that what you call it a magnetic field gamma really 
doesn't go to any pole or to any charge because it has no charge itself so that's why it doesn't get deflected the magnetic field all right and I did not mean narrow beam of radiation because sorry uh, I was gonna say magnetic field when it just moved up in so supposedly this thing just popped up over there all right next question Determine how much of the original count rate 150 counts per second if any is due to each type of radiation So we know is a 150 minus of an X is equal to 60 it fell to 60 So that X is equal to X1. I mean X1 is equal to um, 90 so we know this one is 90 We don't it's just two marks you can do it in your head But I'm writing this just for the sake so people understand clearly so we know it fell to 60 in the end so 60 was the final, but it got subtracted by something to give us 20, and that is obviously, um, that is 40. And we know that gamma was not present because the background radiation was equal to the final radiation that was recorded. Background radiation is 20, and we know that these things weren't corrected to background radiation, so <laughs> gamma is not present. All right. So, hope you guys enjoyed this, and plus, I was a bit tired when I did this, but hopefully you got through. And now don't worry if it seemed hard or intimidating, practice many past papers. The reason you're even watching this video is because, you know, you're just preparing for physics for your board exam. Relax, take in many examples. I think this was a great paper, and it's going to help you really, uh, like, greatly for May, June, and October, November, and all the coming years. Thanks to Cambridge International, International Examinations for their paper. Stay tuned. Alright, later.